So good afternoon, everybody. And hello to, to Laszlo, to Sundus, and to our participants that are still finding their way into this uh, virtual room. Um, I would like to perhaps give the floor directly to you, Sundus, um, for you to make the presentation um, of uh, humans uh, in the EU. And after that, I'll have the pleasure then to explain to our participants the open call that we have. FEPS has launched for the policy competitions of Culture Europe 10. Over to you, Sundus. Okay, thank you. Hello, everyone. But I just wanted to say, Maria, are you sure you want me to go first? Because uh, I don't know how, how long your call would last, but in any case, can everyone see me and hear me well? Okay, all good. I like the thumbs up. So I would like to do a presentation of indeed the Humans in the EU project, but I'd just like to already say from the outset that I will also want this to be interactive and for everyone to be involved. So I'll, I'll do my presentation, show you what it's about, and then leave some room for questions and discussion around the project. So let me share my screen first. There we go. Okay. Here we go. Um, so, humans in the EU. It's a storytelling project about the human face of Europe in a nutshell. And uh, what this project aims to do is to really create the face of a Europe that is made for and by its citizens, well, as it is, and this through the power of arts and communications. So let's first have a bit of background. Why did this project start in the first place? Because as we all know, unfortunately, there's a rise in authoritarianism, nationalism, and xenophobia in Europe. There's a lack of trust in our governments and especially in European institutions and with citizens that are distrusting the very core of a union that wants them to live peacefully and happily, the, the Humans in the EU project felt it was very important to actually project an image to these citizens of an EU that cares about them and also an EU that is very relatable. And how to do that by using portraits and stories of people that work directly for the European Union or people that are linked to the European project in any way. So the project was initially started in 2018 and it was mainly focused on presenting stories of people that worked for the Euro European institutions or European civil society, let's say as we call it in, in uh, Brussels, the EU bubble. Uh, but as of now, the project is being relaunched with official support and funding from the European Parliament with this new angle of actually still presenting stories of people that work for European institutions and the European bubble, but also people out there, any human beings that are present on the European continent and that are very much part of this project. Why this important angle and link? Because we at Alliance for Europe, now the organization behind this artistic project, we go from the belief that it's as important to tell the story of um, Margaret Vestager as it is important to tell the story of Ahmed who lives in Molenbeek in Brussels and these two beings are an equal part of the European project. But there's a lot of text here and I'm talking about a visual storytelling project so actually I want to get to the part where I show you some concrete examples for you to understand better. Oh, there's one more slide actually with some important metrics that we need to take a look at here. So the project so far has uh, produced more than 150 photo stories of people and has gathered uh, thousands, tens of thousands of followers on Facebook and Instagram. And that was before it actually got um, support and funding from the European Parliament. So now we're also hoping to use some of this funding for more targeted advertising and obviously increase our reach. But the important metric that I want us all progressives to look at here is the fact that the majority of people um, drawn to this project are young women. So you see here it's written in French, but in any case, so the, the, ma the major age bracket that is following the project is uh, women from 
25 to 34 years old. And why is this metric important? Obviously, we want the project to appeal to as many people as possible, but it's important because according to several studies, accord, including one study that we did at Alliance for Europe, the sad reality is that young women are the segment of the European population that votes that is least likely to vote and we want actually to stimulate the segment to vote because they tend to vote uh well let's say not for authoritarian regimes and the such so we want to stimulate more of that and we want also to use artistic projects such as humans in the eu to um again connect young women and also connect citizens to the european project so let's take a look at some of the stories for you to understand a bit better uh, i'll just come back here quickly because i want to check that everyone can see the screen yes i just don't want to be talking to myself okay i see that everyone is good so back to the stories the first um, aspect of these stories is that we want to appeal to the emotional side of people. So we want to steer away from the general jargon that can seem a bit distant from certain citizens. So I think a lot of us understand political terms, understand uh, European affairs, but again, we want any person out there to feel connected to the European project. So, for example, when we did the interview of Jaume, who is the director general of the director general of communications uh, at the European Parliament and also the European Parliament spokesperson, we didn't ask him about his work or about um, just his background in, in policy or in communications. We really asked him about his personal life and he gave several moving stories about his family history. And uh, you see here that he talks about the fact that he misses his father who lives in Spain, the fact that it's difficult for uh, a foreigner to live in Brussels away from their country of origin. Again, it's something that I think a lot of us share and can relate to. Similarly, oops. Uh, similarly, uh, when we interviewed Pier, Pier Francesco, who's a social media officer at the European Commission, he talked about a sad story, the fact that he lost his mother when he was quite young um, and how he managed to overcome this, this pain and the handicap of this loss. And this story performed quite well on social media. A lot of people felt for him and the subtle uh, angle here is that the person interviewed talks about something personal and at the end it says that they are working for a European institution and so that helps really humanize people that can be portrayed as grey or unaccessible by a lot of the media out there. So that's for the emotional side. Then we also ask people about their civic engagement and also their commentaries on European affairs. So just to take one of these three examples we have in the middle, Ulrike Guerreau, who's a political scientist, but also the founder of the European Democracy Lab in, in Berlin. And she talks about European democracy, the European institutions, how can we uh, advance European democracy together. So that's, let's say, less about her personal life and more about her engagement as a citizen with the European public discourse. But again, we want to give people the choice to talk about what, what they are truly passionate about. And here we also have the example of Eugenia, who was a parliamentary assistant, and she talks about uh, the matter of European citizenship, which is interesting because she's actually Albanian, and there's this whole question of uh, the Balkans integration and the matters of who is European, who is not European. Uh, similarly to the right, we have Mattia, who is from Croatia, who works at the Commission and who talks about how emotionally attached he is to the EU per his origin and his background because Croatia has lived through a war and, and they were just very eager to be part of this peaceful union that is the European Union. And then we see that, um, so the stories tend to bridge different segments of the European public discourse and European society. We have people from the institutions, we have people from um, the NGO sector, we have uh, people from cons the consultancy sector. 
and so on. Now to the new content, because I said at the beginning of this presentation that the project was being relaunched now, and it's been relaunched with two different uh, major angles. So the first one is that, well, the stories will be produced not just in-house by us who live in Brussels, but by a network of artists and storytellers and journalists all across Europe. And we will be curating their content because we really want to have a pan-European approach and reach. So it didn't really make sense anymore to just do interviews and stories of people based in Brussels and then pretend to be talking about the European Union. We really want stories from, let's say, a small village in Poland produced by a Polish filmmaker there. Uh, and, and so on. This applies to all of the different European countries. And we see, for example, that this is uh, a, a screen from a video interview that was conducted about a painter, filmmaker, and artist called Kiskeya, where she is based in Brussels, Belgium. But this was conducted by a Croatian filmmaker and artist. Then we see as well that uh, these photos and stories uh, were captured by a Romanian visual artist called Mihaela Norok. And uh, if there are any Romanians in the audience, uh, please bear with my accent here, uh, with the Romanian names. Uh, but so her mission, Mihela, is to actually take photos of women all across Europe and show how they manage to link their sense of tradition with their uh, sense of empowerment and being modern cosmopolitan women in Europe. Then another example of new content, it's uh, an, a short interview of Margaret Vestager, uh, who's executive vice president of the European Commission uh, that I myself conducted not too long ago. And the reason why I wanted to show this story where she talks, by the way, about how her grandmother who passed away had taught her how to knit and sew and how this skill really helped her get through the COVID crisis um because it really helped her battle stress and anxiety on a daily basis and during the, the beginning the early days of this lockdown uh mrs Vestager was separated from her husband and and three daughters and her dog as well for months and it was really difficult and again this is a story that helps humanize you know when you you hear Vestager, you think about the commission you think about institutions but here the story is really about her personal struggle and the fact that just like any other person in the world she experienced stress and anxiety and especially during this past year that has been uh, a bit harder for a lot of us and the reason why I wanted to show this story is because we really want to keep this aspect of humanizing people that are within this European bubble. It's just that the difference now is that we, we do not only tell stories like this, we also tell stories of, as you saw above, for example, these women that are respectively from Italy, Greece, Germany, and then this story of this artist based in Brussels. And that it's not just me or us in-house producing the stories, but also artists from all over Europe sending us the stories. And yes, so it's it's a project done by us at Alliance for Europe, and we are a not-for-profit organization that connects pro-European and pro-democratic actors across Europe to engage citizens more. And we have as our main media partner, Are We Europe, uh, a pan-European media organization that wants to create a, a European narrative. And... I'll just stop sharing my screen. And in the meantime, I also want to say that um, we really do believe that by allowing artists to send us stories about different humans across Europe, we also want these artists themselves to become a more integral part of building the European narrative and being part of the European public discourse, because there really is a gap between us who are interested in European affairs and the cultural sector that, again, particularly during this pandemic, has been feeling and, and just been a bit more left out than, than other sectors. So we want to humanize the face of the EU. We want to 
tell stories of a lot of different Europeans on the same platform. And we also want artists to really feel like, yes, we're contributing to the European project. We are producing stories that have impact and so on. And so with the time that we have left, I would say, are there any questions or comments? I see some cheer from Maria. Thank you so much for that. <laughs> um, any comments or questions regarding this? Because I could also go on about it, but I really want to hear maybe your opinions or your feedback on the project or just, yes, don't hesitate. I see a question from Yasmin Najim. Hello. So should we concentrate more on everyday work in people in the EU to discuss the European project bigger picture? I'm afraid that although we try to make all these stories personable, workers still won't feel it relevant to them as the main difference is some people are in power and we are not. It's always been the problem when presenting EU institutions to the wider public. People can hardly identify with them really. Should we tell stories of the majority of European citizens who are not always involved directly in the EU project. Who can participate? More storytelling is important. I think these three questions and remarks are linked indeed. Uh, thank you for your remark and your question and your questions, actually. So this is the point, is that now the project, even though it's aimed at humanizing the European institutions by telling stories of these people, the result was that it may have also seemed that we were again given a platform for these people who already have a platform. We were again giving them a platform to tell their stories. And now we really want the project to amplify the stories of people from underrepresented communities. So people of color, people of uh, the LGBTIQ plus community, women, and also people that work within the, the European sphere, let's not say bubble or institutions, and that do not have official positions. And that's why at the beginning I gave the example of uh, this person that I just invented, Ahmed, who lives in Molenbeek, but because we want the, uh, all people to feel an integral part of this project. And just to comment, I'm... Okay, I'm, I'm trying to go through the questions that uh, I'm glad that you're all interacting at once. Okay, is there any translation for people who don't speak English, Chris? Um, this is a good question, Chris. So at the moment, for example, we are working with, um, because one other change of humans in the EU is that the stories will not just be photos and stories anymore. It's a multimedia storytelling project now. So at the moment, uh, we are working on an audio story by a German journalist and the agreement so far is that she will provide the original in German and then also a voiceover in English because since we are pan-European we also want artists to have the freedom to produce stories in their own language but indeed the core language has always been English and so what we want is to have English as the core but also other languages wherever possible. I think this is so this is from Chris. Then Leah says, I think this is a fantastic project. How could the project build upon its work and engage more with people new to migrant and refugee citizens? How can they be included and in their unique experiences, perceptions? This is a very good question. And actually, this is one major change and, and angle that we're taking now is that we really want to put a special focus on people from underrepresented communities as I just said. And so from the presentation that I just showed, um, if you've noticed the first content, uh, the, the painter and filmmaker Kiskea is a, is a woman of color and she works specifically on topics of racism and anti-discrimination in the EU. And actually recently, if you, if you go through the Facebook and Instagram pages and also the website coming soon, you will see that a lot of the stories are covering uh, people of color and also one upcoming one will be about people of the LGBTIQ community also as it's Pride Month in Belgium and it will be Pride Month in Germany and actually in many parts of the world in June so we really want to, to amplify these voices uh, because as I said the ones that have been, have been amplified so far already have their platform they're already part of the European discourse and we want these underrepresented communities to have their voices and stories told on an equal footing. Okay, Yasmin loves the new direction. Great, <laughs> thank you. Okay, Maria. 
A last question, perhaps? Uh, sure. Uh, Gun Gunter asks, wonderful, how will we be informed when do we start? But I don't think that's for me, actually. I think this was for Maria. Fatima Latik, hello there. She says, all the diverse voices, stories, and images need to be seen and heard in Europe. Exactly. And this is what we aim to do. That's the motto, isn't it? It, it is. But I think Gunter had one question that was not for me and then asked, but if you do not belong to these groups, isn't it also about class? Well, I don't like to use the term class, but more strata. Uh, and um, I think it's about embracing the differences that exist and try to bridge them through art and democracy. We're not in denial of the fact that there are differences, but we have to acknowledge that there are people who are underrepresented and we're going to go out there. Well, once the restrictions pass or we will find them, some somewhere or, or another and and help them tell their stories and thank you very much for the support fatima and yasmin and everyone uh i think i answered most of the questions thank you very much thank you so thank you thank you sundos and uh thank you uh laszlo uh, i think it's then the time for a quick explanation uh to our participants joining us back home of the competitions that feps has launched just now uh for all of you to to take part so first and foremost again uh sincere apologies of uh the technical glitches that we faced in the very beginning but we will make sure to compensate it to all of you so about the competitions uh when feps announced felt a culture of 10 conference the anniversary of our annual conference we conveyed that the floor the virtual floor is also available to all of you all of the participants joining us back home and how by clicking on the registration form that I will share again uh, throughout uh, the days that we have ahead uh, and the journey that we have ahead for Call to Europe. This is the way in which you can participate. How, what we want to understand from you is what's next af after COVID-19 for Europe, for the European project. You can tweet, you can make a policy competition, you join us because you will have the opportunity then to take the virtual stage on the day three of Culture Europe, Thursday, 27th of May, with all of the secretary generals of FEP's sister organizations. So how exciting is that? But this is not only the uh, the only competition that we have actually. So uh, our secretary general also drafted a FEPS quiz for all of you. So this FEPS quiz, I would say it's quite challenging. Uh, but then again, I invite you all to have a look and try to answer um, this quiz. It's about the history uh, of social democracy. 10 questions, and the one that sends me, to me, Maria Freitas, uh, the cracked uh, FEPS quiz will also be called to the virtual stage on the 27th of May to receive a prize. So this was the um, introduction about the policy competitions. Um, and now we will again, with the support uh, of another FEPS team colleague, uh, Celine Gedge, to then screen the surprise that we had uh, in store for our participants at the beginning of this conference. So let's say, fingers crossed all of us that the technicalities support us and they do. Thank you very much, Celine, for your help. Tune in. Sound. I can't hear the sound on my end. No, Celine, maybe maybe you have the microphones on. I'm not sure if she's listening to us. Sorry, microphone on. There you go.
Thank you very much, Celine, for um, uh, making it, uh, you know, and sharing uh, the video that FAPS team has prepared for our participants. And now we will uh, hopefully rely on you again uh, so that uh, our Secretary General is then able to present his surprise for our participants of Culture Europe today, which is uh, the Culture Europe Pecha Kucha. So, Celine, if you, if you can, we warmly invite you to try and share the screen again. Maria, do you explain what the Pecha Kucha is? Yes, I'll explain what the Pecha Kucha is indeed. So this is, let's say, the most challenging uh, way of presenting uh, a PowerPoint presentation where the speaker only has 19 seconds to uh, explain what the picture actually is about. Uh, so this is the challenge that uh, our Secretary General has embarked on um, with the FEPS team. And in this way, um, Laszlo will explain to all of us the big legacy that uh, Culture Europe is. Over to you, Laszlo. Thank you very much. Uh, just let me know when the clock starts ticking, as Michel Barnier would say. And now you can see this is Call uh, to Europe, um, which has become a FEPS flagship annual conference, a reference point for the progressive family in Europe and beyond. And here you can see where it all began, a public opinion survey in 2011, which showed that a lot of Europeans started to be disaffected uh, why exactly? Because we were in a recession and somebody invented the so-called Troika, uh, pushing austerity, the European Central Bank increasing the interest rate in the wrong time. Uh, so everything was going to the wrong direction. And then as a response, Call to Europe number one was organized bibliotech survey, Solvay, sorry, <laughs> after the survey, a Solvay. Um, it looks like a cafe house, not a Kranken house in uh, Vienna, but in reality, it was the first call to Europe event. International Europe was on the agenda together with next social and economic Europe. And here, the first um, set of speakers, and they are also still very active today. Uh, some of them, Zita, uh, Andreas, as well as Vivian, also participating in this uh, conference. Professor Tello recently intervened on multilateralism. And there you have Cathy Ashton, uh, Court Europe number two, uh, organized on a fascinating topic, the European External Action Service, which was then a new game in town. Court Europe 2012, still, um, I would say, the meeting of uh, generations, some of uh, the very experienced one, like, for example, Mr. Kovac, former party leader, foreign minister, um, but also the young ones, like Laura Ballarin or Lorenza Antonucci. And here we go, 2013, Call to Europe number three, Beyond Austerity, introducing to Brussels the young Mariana Mazzucato. Since then, she became almost a kind of celebrity, producing many other books, but this one, The Entrepreneurial State, is her classic. Wow, 2013, called Europe number three, Beyond Austerity. That was a speech I delivered shortly after Barroso delivered his, his State of the Union one, and one of my colleagues in the college said the day after Laszlo, this was the real State of the Union speech. Call to Europe number four, building solidarity in a silent policy and call for solidarity. Um, all these terrible developments across the Mediterranean Sea raise the interest 
about this uh, uh, topic with migrant arrivals uh, exceeding 150,000, a real crisis that continued um, and, and building solidarity became an eternal task. Uh, leave uh, to remain filmed with uh, the director and actors opened the conference, uh, the debate, uh, which you can see uh, with Bruce Goodison, movie director. Um, Je suis Charlie. Uh, Charlie Hebdo, uh, someone already mentioned this earlier today, uh, the call to Europe number five after the terrorist attacks and all the fears and anxiety about how Islam plays a role in European society, culture, and to some extent also politics. A special guest called to Europe number five, Federica Mogherini, uh, together with another distinguished panel on religious uh, communities. Indeed, creating unity out of diversity uh, is a motto we have to pursue. Then uh, we overcome the region, uh, the, the, the generational divide as opposed to the regional one. Millennials and politics um, uh, became a flagship uh, for FEPS uh, and uh, that was presented in the number six uh, in 2016. Uh, you see a very large number of millennials was actually joining this FEPS event on a Saturday afternoon, which is not the usual one and very challenging because it clashes with very important football games. 2017, Court Europe number seven, democracy first, strengthening democracy in Europe and the member states became a very, very important uh, question at the time of so-called populism following the breakthrough of uh, Donald Trump in the United States and unfortunate events like Brexit in Europe. Some of the distinguished guests who were working uh, and still work on rewriting the fiscal rules, Joseph Stiglitz and uh, Pierre Moscovici, of course, former commissioner, former MEP, former minister, and another former minister and current uh, executive vice president can be seen here as former Spitzenkandidat, uh, Franz Timmermans, together with other distinguished speakers across Europe, because um, in 2018 and 19, Call to Europe was organized in many different uh, locations. And here we go, uh, someone who eventually uh, became uh, Commission President Ursula von der Leyen, uh, together with uh, Franz Timmermans, and behind von der Leyen, the dark horse is obviously Valdis Dombrovskis. 2020, the first online call to Europe with two important topics in the focus, climate justice and gender equality. A commissioner on the left, a minister on the right, which is always uh, part of the lineup. 2020 uh, continues um, with climate justice and gender equality uh, here. And we were entering also the year of the pandemic. And uh, despite the lockdowns in uh, many uh, European countries, of course, there was a lot of attention paid to our uh, program. This time around 2021, mind the social gaps, um, income gap, gender gap, territorial and generational uh, is in the focus of the program and the discussions which are forthcoming today, tomorrow and Thursday. Voila, this is the participatory as well as progressive and positive uh, call to Europe. Thanks to everybody who organized this in the past 10 years and participated in pictures like this one. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, indeed, Laszlo. So I hope that our participants enjoyed the journey uh, of Culture Europe in these past 10 years. And we warmly invite you now to leave this virtual room and join the networking session that is taking place just now. So leave this session, enter the lobby, connect to the next program item, which is networking session, 
and most importantly, have fun. You will be paired with colleagues from all over Europe for three minutes, you will be able to engage in a chat, in a conversation, and discuss what you found about the first day of Call to Europe. And don't forget that later on, uh, we will still have a couple of sessions. So a kind reminder as well for you participants. So uh, at 6.30 CET, we will have the Call to Europe X talk with uh, Ed Miliband. So let's not forget to tune in for that one. And later on tonight, we will have a night owl session where a book presentation will take place with Professor Ursula Hughes at 20.30 CET. So hoping to see all of you in, in, in the virtual uh, networking session and you too, Laszlo. See you in a bit. Bye, everybody. <laughs>